Funding for lawmakers comes from the University of West Georgia in Carrollton, ensuring a better life for Georgians in the 21st century. More than 100 programs of study prepare students for successful careers in the critical professions of education and nursing, as well as business and the liberal arts. The Georgia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of Georgia's business community, over 4,000 members strong, working with lawmakers for over 90 years to make sure that our state remains a place where companies thrive. And by supporters of Georgia Public Broadcasting. Thank you. Coming up on Lawmakers, the Senate approves the amended FY09 budget, crediting federal stimulus funds with cushioning the blow of declining revenues. The Governor Purdue backed plan to overhaul the state's transportation agencies clears its first legislative hurdle. And we'll talk with Tom Crawford of CapitalImpact.com for his thoughts on this week under the Gold Dome. Those stories and more are coming up next. Live from Atlanta, this is Lawmakers. Here are your anchors, and Wandy Lawson and David Zelski. Good evening, everyone. Also on tonight's broadcast, House Speaker Glenn Richardson amends marriage license legislation to allow Georgia's constitutional officers to conduct wedding ceremonies. And controversy over allegations that 22 state legislators are delinquent on their state income taxes touches off debate on the Senate floor. But first, our top story tonight, the $18.9 billion mid-year state spending plan passes the Senate. House Bill 118, the FY09 amended budget, passed on the Senate floor today. Senate Appropriations Chairman Jack Hill went through what he believes are the headlines in the budget, but he also discussed the positive effect of the stimulus money. The headline may say, uh, Senate passes uh, homeowners tax relief, a budget with $428 million in homeowners tax relief. And that, those funds are in there. They're in that budget, in the House budget, and we've agreed to that. So that's pretty much off the table. The second lead may, may probably say that the Senate joins the House in funding uh, education cuts and austerity restoration of $145 million uh, with the suggestion to the governor that those be funded from part of the stimulus funds that are coming to prevent those cuts to education. Many of you can remember us referring it as to as a $20 billion budget. Well, we're certainly not there today and, and it reflects what we see around us in these economic conditions. How do we make this drop of this this, this magnitude. Uh, well, we've done it by using reserves and we've done it by using cuts to agencies. In fact, in this budget, uh, we're using re reserve funds of some, our, our basic rainy day funds of some 200 million and we're using uh, federal stimulus funds of 145 million for education and 482 million in Medicaid federal stimulus funds. So we have already had because of the dropping revenue picture, we've already had to start using the stimulus funds to just to fill the hole that was created. And I will tell you this, we could not have done, uh, we could not have funded the homeowner's tax relief and we could not have, have continued with the revenue drop of $460 million, $450 million. We could not have done that without those Medicaid funds from the federal government. Again, House Bill 118, the amended FY09 budget passed 49 to 2, and due to changes in some Senate committee, it goes back to the House. In the end, a conference committee will most likely hammer out the differences between the House and Senate versions. Well, the Senate today approved a plan backed by Governor Purdue to overhaul the state's transportation agencies, and lawmakers Valerie Edwards is here to tell us more about that. Valerie. David, SB 200 would create a new state agency, the State Transportation Authority. Senate President Pro Tem Tommy Williams is the bill's sponsor. He explains why the change is needed. I'm not blaming the folks that work at DOT, but here's how it works. There, there are three phases to any job. There's the preliminary engineering, which includes the environmental work, there's the right-of-way purchase, and then there's the construction. The legislator thinks that project is going, the board member thinks that project going, they put it on the shelf. A few years later, they find out it's on the shelf, they go back and check on it, they're upset about it, they've been lied to about it, they pull that project down again. Maybe five years have gone by, they decided now it's time to 
work on the right of way. You're looking at 10 to 15 years it might take DOT, because of the politics of DOT, to get a job ready to let. Appointments to the new agency will come five from the governor's office and three each from the speaker and the lieutenant governor. And while SB 200 passed in the Senate 30 to 25, the measure was not without controversy, as some question what's been described as a concentration of power at the top. Democratic Senator Vincent Fort expressed the sentiments echoed by several of his colleagues. I don't understand how we as legislators, Republican or Democrat, how we would give up the authority or the power to be involved on the front end, on the front end in the appointing process, um, only to rubber stamp after the fact. Because let's be very honest with ourselves, when, those appoint when that list of appointees comes to your desks, it's going to be a rubber stamp for the governor. Earlier today, I spoke with Jeff Mullis, who chairs the Senate Transportation Committee. He says he's confident the measure will pave the way, if you will, to bring new business to our state. Okay, thanks for that report, Valerie. Thank you, David. The House today agreed that information about sickle cell disease should be provided to those applying for marriage licenses. By the time House Bill 184 came to a vote, though, it also allowed the state's constitutional officers to perform marriages. Is this your first time in the wheel? No. Oh. First, there was Representative Henry Howard's failed attempt to haze Representative Gloria Frazier. I will. Uh, 25 years in marriage. Uh, can I go back and have my testing done? You can go right now to your public health department and have that test done to assure that you do not carry this trait. And then a rare appearance in the well by House Speaker Glenn Richardson, who wanted to amend the bill. This bill touches marriage licenses, and all it does is put in a different category of other people that can perform marriages. Here's how this came up. It wasn't very long ago I noticed that our governor was asked to perform a marriage ceremony, and he wasn't allowed to do that under Georgia law. Every other state around us allows the governor, the lieutenant governor, the speaker, and their constitutional officers to perform marriages. All this does is in the marriage license section, it lets your constitutional officers, the governor, lieutenant governor, speaker, speaker pro tem, president, president pro tem, and other constitutional officers, it authorizes them to perform marriage. The measure passed 155 to 1 with the Richardson Amendment. Drawing this exchange between Representative Roger Bruce and House Speaker pro tem Mark Burkhalter. Do we now have to refer to you and the speaker as Reverend? <laughs> Only if you're looking to get married. House Bill 184 now goes over to the Senate. And the Senate also passed a budget transparency bill today. SB 206, sponsored by Senate Appropriations Committee Vice Chairman Greg Goggins, creates a public record for state tax expenditures and tax breaks. Senator Goggins was brief in the well this afternoon, but actually explained the bill in detail during Tuesday's Appropriations Committee meeting. What we're asking to have done through this bill is that each year, along with the, the budget process, when the budget is presented, OPB, the governor's office, they, along with the budget, will include a tax expenditure program, a tax expenditure, and it's called a tax expenditure budget report. And so this will allow us to quantify the magnitude of those tax policies. And I hope you all can agree that this would give us a much uh, broader picture, but also the citizens of this state, a, a bigger, broader picture of how their tax dollars are being used. And I also hope that you would agree that this is good policy that we should enact in the state of Georgia. And SB 206 ended up passing on the Senate floor 52 to zero and now goes over to the House. In other news, a change to Senate rules to investigate tax delinquent senators failed on the floor today. And lawmakers Brittany Evans has been following the story and joins us live from the Capitol with the latest. Brittany. 
Thanks, David. SR 452, sponsored by Senate Ethics Committee Chairman Eric Johnson, would have allowed the Commissioner of Revenue to be able to file ethics complaints against senators who are delinquent on their taxes. The ethics chair would then privately investigate and decide if reprimand or removal is necessary. Senate Democrats accused Johnson of using this legisla legislation excuse me, as a political stunt. Senator Stoner begins. This is just political theater. What you're going to do is you're going to ride that white horse so tall that the fall is going to kill you. Senate Democratic leader Robert Brown defended accusations that he was delinquent on his taxes. He says that after poor health and misplaced records, he had filed an extension. This is nothing but a political move by somebody who is desperately running for, uh, in his primary. He's trying to reach out everywhere he can reach. He doesn't care who he run over, runs over. It doesn't make any difference with him. But let me tell you something. When it comes down to it, this kind of thing ends up hurting each and every one of us. Senator Johnson expressed his surprise and dismay over the opposition. I have been here for 17 years in this building and probably have never been as shocked as I am today at the reaction to what I thought would be a unanimous vote. The resolution failed 32 to 16, not receiving the, need, the needed two-thirds vote. And that bill is now dead. Reporting live at the Capitol, I'm Brittany Evans for Lawmakers. Thanks for that report, Brittany. Well, school districts are one step closer to greater control over how they allocate funds for media centers and instruction. Representative Matt Ramsey led the passage of House Bill 278, which received somewhat reluctant support from House Democratic Leader DeBose Porter. All right, we apologize for that Thank technical you. difficulty on that particular tape. Hope to get you more on that. In other House news, HB 278 passed uh, 147 to 6. That measure that would give school districts that greater flexibility moves over to the Senate. The House also voted today to allow a judge to revoke probation if the probationer commits certain crimes in other states. Representative Rich Golick said that HB 329 could have prevented the 2006 murder of Jennifer Ewing. We're unable to get you tape of that debate either, but we did want to let you know that House Bill 329 did pass 156 to 1. It's also going to move over to the Senate. Patrons of strip clubs in Georgia could soon find themselves paying a surcharge, and lawmakers Minu Hosseini is live at the Capitol with that story. Minu. David, the proposed sin tax would place an additional $5 fee on attendance to adult entertainment venues. Bill sponsor Senator Jack Murphy explains. There's a direct correlation between the uh, adult entertainment uh, industry or the strip clubs, whatever you want to call them, and prostitution, child prostitution. A surcharge of $5 is being offered in the bill to charge the adult, uh, the, the, the patrons that go into the adult uh, entertainment centers. And I don't really believe that $5 is a huge charge Senator Jack Murphy also reminded us that any revenue collected from this sin tax would go towards rehabilitating victims of sexual abuse, not towards the state's budget deficit. I want to emphasize this $5 surcharge has nothing to do with our budget shortfall. It has nothing to do with our budget shortfall. This is simply a fee, uh, a surcharge to help get our children off of the streets. Senate Bill 91, the last bill on the Senate Finance Committee's agenda, received a due pass recommendation and now moves on to House to Senate rules. Reporting live, I'm Minu Hosseini for Lawmakers. Thanks so much, Minu. The Georgia House of Representatives played a role in the international arrest warrant issued for the president of Sudan. That's according to Representative Tyrone Brooks. Brooks thanked the House today for adopting a resolution in 2007 condemning the genocide in Sudan, which has claimed 300,000 lives. The International Criminal Court charged President Omar Hassan al-Bashir, the president of the Sudan, with war crimes they did not indict him for genocide, but there is sufficient evidence to do that. But I want to thank you because when they read out the states from the United States of America that were on record, they called the name of Georgia. 
one of your resolutions that you adopted on last year, and I want to thank you, and I want you to just give yourselves a round of applause for being a part of helping in genocide in the Sudan. Brooks is currently sponsoring HB 99, prohibiting state retirement funds from investing in companies that support Sudan. That measure is currently in the House Retirement Committee. In other news, Georgia teachers who have been nationally board certified receive a 10 percent salary supplement. Today, the House Higher Education Committee voted to end that program for future board certified teachers. Lawmakers Emily Banks joins us live from the Capitol with that story. Emily. In Wandi, in the face of a tight budget, supporters of HB 243 say the program that pays these teachers that 10 percent incentive might not be paying off. Bill sponsor Representative Ed Setzler explains the bill. I think there's simply a question, is this, is this a 10 percent supplement that's the best use of our scarce education dollars? And this simply uh, proposes um, to not compromise direct promises made by the state to these high achieving teachers. The question of how to phase out the program became the main debate when Representative Jan Jones proposed an amendment that would completely end the supplement when a teacher's current certification expires. Representative Kathy Ash spoke against the amendment. I think that if what we're talking about is national board certification, we ought to have a real debate about what happens to student achievement when a national board certified teacher is in a classroom. And we've not had that debate. We've just decided that because there isn't money to fund it this year, and maybe not next year, we're going to destroy a program. Because basically, if we pass this bill as amended by your amendment, is it not true that we have said national board certification should disappear from Georgia? In the end, that amendment did not pass. Instead, all teachers who currently receive the supplement will continue to for as long as they continue to teach. The committee also gave HB 455 a due pass recommendation. That bill would give school districts an extra month this year to decide on teacher contracts. The new deadline would be May 15th. Reporting live, I'm Emily Banks for Lawmakers. Thanks so much, Emily. And now we have the results of our online poll for you. When asked, do you think utility companies should be able to charge current customers for future power plant construction? 100% of respondents actually said no. Be sure and visit gpb.org lawmakers to vote in the next legislative issue poll. Well, it's the end of the seventh legislative week under the Gold Dome. That's the perfect time to check in with Tom Crawford. He's the national editor of CapitalImpact.com. I sat down with Tom earlier and began by asking him whether the federal stimulus package would cushion the blow of the governor's announcement earlier this week that $1.6 billion would be cut from the FY2010 budget. Thanks to the federal stimulus uh, funds, that's exactly what's going to happen because at the same time that the governor cut $1.6 billion out of his official revenue estimate. He said he's also going to bring in 1.1 billion from uh, the federal economic recovery plan. So that will hopefully help the state affect or avoid really deep cuts in education, public health, uh, public safety, things like that. So it's, it's bad, but it could be a lot worse. Well, I guess that's going to be the uh, credo for the whole session. Looking at some other legislation coming through this week, both the House and the Senate passing changes to voter registration. Right. The uh, really virtually identical bill on both the House and the Senate side, it requires you to show evidence of citizenship, either through a birth certificate, passport, whatever, when you register to vote. Uh, it's, of course, we have heard the same objections here that we heard on the photo ID bill a few years ago, which is it will make it more difficult for blacks, Latinos, elderly people to vote. Uh, Democrats feel that perhaps it's a little unfair for that reason, but those both were, uh, seem to be running on parallel tracks right now. We had a bit of a surprise there, perhaps for some in the House yesterday, SB 83 coming through the floor and then failing to pass. Right, that was one that increases the homestead exemption, I believe, from 2000 to 4000 a year. Uh, because it's a tax, a property tax exemption issue, it needed a two-thirds vote in the House. While they had enough for a majority vote, they could not get a two-thirds vote. And I think this bill uh, faced a tough fight from the beginning anyway because there are so many local governments that are concerned it'll make it harder for them to do things like keep policemen on the streets. 
Well, you know, as uh, there have been some creative suggestions for how to uh, stimulate the economy, and some of the uh, ways included, like the Sunday sales measure, which uh, appears dead for now. Right. For the third year in a row, the attempts to uh, legalize Sunday package sales of beer, wine, and alcohol uh, has basically gone by the, by the wayside. Uh, Senator Seth Harp, who's been fighting for it now for a long time, saw we didn't have the votes in committee yesterday, so rather than uh, face defeat, he just pulled it. Maybe at some other point they'll try to uh, sneak it back in there, but it seems to be a lost cause for the time being. You know, they uh, also, Ron Stevens in the House has his Pass the Buck initiative trying to add a dollar sales tax to each pack of cigarettes. Where does it look like that legislation might be headed? I don't think that's going anywhere either. Uh, th this is going to be a hard session to get anything like that out of here that can be used against you as a tax increase criticism. So where, where do you think lawmakers are going to go then in terms of some of the, uh, the ways that they might stimulate the economic growth here in Georgia? Well, I'm not sure there's a lot you can do at the state level compared to what you can do at the federal level because the federal government, as we know, can spend billions and billions of dollars. About all they can do at the state level is maybe try to enact some tax cuts, but uh, I'm not sure right now that's going to create a lot of jobs, quite frankly. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, earlier when the uh, legislature passed its schedule, was proposing to wait and see what was going to happen with the federal stimulus and possibly coming back in June to wrap up the session, passing a new uh, adjournment resolution today. That's right. They, uh, they know how much money is coming in. They know they don't have to wait around for it, so they're going to try to adjourn on April 3rd, which is a fairly normal time, I think, for getting the folks out of here. I guess that's going to make it a little bit easier for those who have to return to their jobs and maybe do some fundraising as well. Well, especially with fundraising, that's correct. <laughs> well, Tom, we thank you so much for your insights here on Lawmakers each and every week. It's Tom Crawford of CapitalImpact.com. Thank you. Thank you. And as you just heard in Wandy and Tom discuss, the General Assembly today adopted a resolution which actually sets the schedule for the remaining 13 legislative days. Under this new schedule, the legislature will adjourn sine die on Friday, April 3rd. For more information about the legislative schedule, visit our website at gpb.org slash lawmakers. Octo mom Nadia Suleiman has been all over the media in the past few weeks, and now she's even influencing Georgia's state legislators. Lawmakers Brittany Evans has that story. I think we need to put some ethical guidelines on the in vitro fertilization IVF industry. Senator Ralph Hudgens sponsors SB 169. The bill would limit the number of embryos implanted in women. The bill comes after Nadia Sulman, a California resident, gave birth to eight babies using in vitro. Today, before the Senate Health and Human Services Committee, Jennifer Lau from the Center for Bioethics and Culture made the case for what she called more natural ways of fertilization. The egg quality is much better in minimal stimulation IVF, better quality embryos, better success implantation makes better, healthier babies. The opposition says the Octomom case is no need for the legislation. Dr. Andy Toledo explains. The Octomom event is certainly the exception and not the norm that goes on in our medical community. This would not happen in Georgia. Mothers that conceive using in vitro also testified. There are other patients out there that are currently seeking treatment that are terrified. They are literally terrified. This bill is going to take away their ability to have a child. Many of the committee members were concerned about possible legal and ethical landmines. The committee voted for SB 169 to now move to a subcommittee for more deliberation. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm Brittany Evans. A bill that would require those that testify before committees of the General Assembly to swear an oath was heard in committee today. Lawmakers Evan Seitz has more. The Senate Special Judiciary Committee met today to vote on Senate Bill 7 legislation that would increase the penalty for individuals who lie under oath from a misdemeanor to a felony. Bill sponsor Senator Ed Tarver believed the change would pressure witnesses to be truthful and accountable for their honesty at all times. Bill Clark of Georgia Trial Lawyers Association agreed, stating that it would be an effective deterrent to deceiving behavior. I believe this will be a very effective deterrent uh, to misbehavior that ultimately could result in a public <coughs> policy decision being made um, based on false information. Everybody who walks through that door will know that they are going to have to tell you the truth. They're not going to be able to mislead you. They're going to have to be honest in their testimony in the information they bring forward to you, and then they are. There was also much discussion on the need for written transcripts of testimony before committees. After all of this, the bill received a due pass recommendation. 
Due to the high cost and slow turnaround of transcribing court reports, SB7 will allow for audio recordings to be used during witness testimonials. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm Evan Seitz. And again, Senate Bill 7 passed, was given a due pass by committee substitute and now goes to Senate rules. Legislation that urges Governor Purdue to open Georgia's coastal areas for oil drill drilling received a due pass recommendation from committee this afternoon. And lawmakers Alan Friedman joins us now and gives us the latest. Alan. Wandi, as we all know, in the last year, gasoline prices have fluctuated to some of the highest levels in our country's history. The pressure to find more American sources for energy is increasing, and today it came to the House Energy Utilities and Telecommunications Committee. Sponsor of the House Bill 421, Representative Harry Geisinger, explains the intent of his legislation. It's a very simple bill. All it does is provide that the General Assembly instructs the governor that when the federal government says, yes, you can go ahead and assess what's offshore, that he directs the Southern States Energy Board to proceed and let the private sector go ahead and assess what's out there in regards to oil and gas. And so what we've done is we've gone ahead and given the governor with this bill uh, a direction of what we expect to have done, assuming the federal government moves in that direction. Again, House Bill 421 received a due pass recommendation and now moves to House rules. Thanks so much, Alan. Thanks, Mwadi. Well, we invite you to check out GPB's online resources at gpb.org slash lawmakers. Find the latest from GPB's radio news team and watch lawmakers online. All that and more at gpb.org slash lawmakers. We invite you to visit that site and vote in our legislative issue poll. Well, changes to Georgia code when it comes to categorizing sex offenders pass the Senate floor on Tuesday. SB 157 aims to correct a bill passed two years ago where portions were found to be unconstitutional. Bill sponsor Senator Seth Harp explains. We divide sexual predators into three categories, level one, level two, and a dangerous predator. And it concentrates the, the resources of law enforcement heavily on the dangerous predator and the extent, the extent of the law is most heavily concentrated on that. SB 157 passed 52 to 2 and now goes to the House. And just a reminder, the Georgia General Assembly has adopted a new legislative schedule for the next four weeks. We will continue to bring you all the latest Capitol news on those legislative days because the General Assembly is in recess tomorrow. Lawmakers returns on Monday, March 9th at 7 p.m. If you have missed any part of this Lawmakers broadcast, tune in tomorrow morning when Lawmakers repeats at 5.30 a.m. here on GPB Television. You can also see this episode of Lawmakers at 7 a.m. on GPB Knowledge. GPB Knowledge is available to those with digital television receivers at point three of your local GPB transmitter. For example, 20.3 in Augusta or 8.3 in Atlanta. You can also keep up with all of the action under the Gold Dome daily on your local GPB radio station during morning edition. Edition, all Things Considered, and Georgia Gazette. Well, coming up on GPB Television, This Old House. That's next here on GPB. That's our broadcast for the 27th legislative day of the 2009 session of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm in Wandy Lawson. And I'm David Zelsky. Join us Monday at 7 p.m. for the next Lawmakers. Have a great weekend. Good night. production of Georgia Public Broadcasting.